Good morning, Legacy Christian Church. Wanted to say hello to everybody that's watching online and at each of our campuses. Today, we're continuing our series in Ecclesiastes, and we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 today. So if you would open your Bibles there or your Bible notebook that we've gave you on week 1 and week 2, we've given out ESV scripture journals for these passages as we study through this book. And so uh, G.K. Chesterton, famous author, famous uh, uh, journalist in England, and he was one of the guys that C.S. Lewis actually really looked up to as a writer. Uh, but he said that meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaningless comes from being weary of pleasure. Now, I think that that's a profound statement because in a culture of complete affluence in which we live, you can click a button on your phone and almost anything you want will be delivered to your doorstep in two days. You can access a myriad of sexual images on the device in your pocket. You can learn about anything on the internet. You can drive five minutes and get pretty much any kind of food that you want. Uh, we are in the most prosperous nation on the planet, yet there's still this gaping sense of emptiness. We have instant access to a thousand different pleasurable experiences, and yet we're still bored. Isn't that interesting? Alexi de Tocqueville, the famous uh, diplomat from France and Europe, he came over to visit the United States and wrote a really famous uh, uh, book about his experience in the United States, the early, early part of the 20th century. And he said, there's a strange melancholy that haunts the inhabitants amidst abundance. And Americans, he said, believe that such prosperity could quench their yearning for happiness, but such a hope was false, de Tocqueville added, because the incomplete joys of this world will never satisfy the human heart. John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress, the author who wrote that Pilgrim's Progress, he said, some things are of the nature as to make one's fancy chuckle while his heart doth ache. Now, why is it that life's most pleasurable experiences seemed laced with a twinge of sadness? Have you ever thought about that? Today, we're continuing in Ecclesiastes where we're exploring the musings of this guy named Kohelet, who probably was King Solomon, and if he wasn't, definitely was pretending to be King Solomon or, or was adopting a King Solomon persona in order to teach Israel some lessons about life and wisdom under the sun. But in this passage, in this book, uh, the, the, the main question is about, is there any meaning to be found in life, if we assume that God doesn't exist, and the phrase for that is under the sun. In chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes, we turn to the pursuit of pleasure and happiness as a possible option as, as King Solomon uh, goes on this lifelong experiment trying to, to find out meaning and purpose. To find this meaning and purpose, he wonders, if I just chase after my own personal pleasure and happiness... Will that produce any sort of gain at the end of the day? Because you remember verse, uh, in verse uh, 3, we had our opening question, is there any gain to be found in life in all of our toil under the sun? And, and uh, King Solomon Kohelet, the preacher, his answer seems to be no. And so as he looks at this pursuit of pleasure, I think it's going to be something that many of us can relate to uh, because uh, verse 1, here's what it says, I said in my heart... So now we're personal pronouns, biographical moment here in the passage. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. Now that phrase, enjoy yourself, actually in Hebrew, literally it means to see the good. And so basically, I'm going to test myself and see what the good life is all about. Solomon wants to experience with chasing after happiness in order to experience what is the good life. When he says, come now to himself, it's the language of permission and incitement. When he says, I will test you, he wants to learn how his heart will respond if he never says no to his desires. Uh, what, what's going to happen inside me over time when I continue to say yes to myself? So that's what, what's going on here. Uh, I will test you with pleasure. My life's going to be the Petri dish, and let's see what grows. Let's see what happens. P that word pleasure, it means being joyful or glad with the whole disposition. It's associated with the heart, the center of the human person, the soul. 
and with the lighting up of the eyes in Proverbs 15. This word is often associated with celebratory feasts. And I think a good way of understanding this word, it's kind of situational joy, or another way of saying it is festival joy. I'm going to test myself with festival joy, meaning I'm going to live from party to party, from mountaintop experience to mountaintop experience. I'm going to chase after happiness and pleasure. And it, what if I never say no to myself and always just chase after the things that make me happy? Now, certainly you can derive pleasure from doing moral things and good things like serving the world and helping other people, but that's not what this uh, pursuit is all about. King Solomon, on the other hand, he wants to pursue the kind of pleasure that is purely sensual and material, and he wants to know how his heart is going to respond. And, uh, you know, on some level, I respect this. I'm interested to talk to people that have gotten super curious about the nature of their own hearts. And they honestly pursue and honestly observe. And on some level, I respect this. And I think it'd be interesting to sit down with this person face to face to, to just pick his brain on life. But as we're going to see, it doesn't act exactly end up where he wants it to. And so in, in the verses in chapter two of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is going to outline his pursuit of happiness by giving us what I would call an almanac of amusements. If God doesn't exist in this world, and you make it your goal to pursue pleasure and happiness, here are your options. It's not a, it, it, this is not a, a long list. You know, you're stranded. If, uh, I read an example about how if you're stranded on a desert island and somebody, and all you have with you are three different board games. You've got Monopoly and uh, let's say Checkers, and you have a deck of cards, or you ha you've got three different games that you can play. Now, you can play those games over and over again, but at the end of the day, you're going to get exhausted of those three games because you don't have an unlimited amount of amusements. In the same way in life, King Solomon says, when he gives us this almanac of amusements, the options for pursuing happiness that we have and pleasure under the sun. Here's the first one in verse 2. He first turns to antics. Ecclesiastes 2.2, I said of laughter, it is mad, and I said of pleasure, what use is it? Kohelet turns to a life of jests and joking. He decides to take nothing seriously, to make a joke out of everything, to let uh, all of life be one giant joke. And to be fair, laughter in the Bible is something that can be either wise or foolish. It's not necessarily bad. Sometimes laughter is used to cover up pain. Proverbs 14, 13 says, Even in laughter the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. Um, you ever read a, a biography by a comedian, and, and it's kind of crazy, you, these people that are very brilliant and funny, but their stories are often very sad and depressing. In the book of Proverbs, laughter is the language of the fool. Proverbs 10.23 says, doing wrong is like a joke to the fool, but wisdom is a pleasure to a man of understanding. Proverbs 29.9 says, if a wise man has an argument with a fool, the fool only rages and laughs. There is no quiet. Proverbs 26.18 says, like a madman who throws firebrands and flaming arrows and death is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I am only joking. That's like one of the clear verses against sarcasm. Yet laughter can also be a good and healthy thing. Lady Wisdom in Proverbs, she laughs in confidence at the days to come in Proverbs 31. Jesus said, blessed are those who weep now for the day is coming when you will laugh. Sometimes laughter is the best medicine for depression. Uh, a joyful heart is a good medicine, but crushed spirit dries up the bones. But it, when you live a life of jest and you make everything a joke, in the end, uh, King Solomon says, this is madness. Now, we'll see this again in chapter 7 when Kohelet will conclude that sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. At least suffering can be a means to something else uh, that's more meaningful and purposeful, but it's impossible to have any meaningful conversation with those who deflect everything with humor. And I know that you know people like that in your life. They deflect everything with a joke or with humor or with a sarcastic comment. And so you don't know how to interact with them. You don't know when they're joking. Uh, there's not a lot of sincere and meaningful dialogue that happens with them. 
So laughter can be something that's either wise or foolish. In chapter 3, Kohelet will say there is a time to laugh. So it would seem that the wisdom of when to laugh, of no, uh, wisdom with laughter is knowing when to laugh and when to be serious. Proverbs 25, 20 says, whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. That's a person who doesn't know when to laugh and when to be serious. Verse three, uh, the second item in this almanac of amusements, these options we have under the sun for pursuing happiness is alcohol. He says, I searched my heart with cheer, how to cheer my body with wine my heart still guiding with me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. There's actually a lot of discussion in the commentaries on what exactly this phrase means to cheer the body with wine. But the Hebrew verb there for cheer means to stretch or to draw out or to pull. Now, I think that what Solomon means here is that he is trying to prolong life's happiness, life's festival joys uh, by using alcohol. Uh, But he also says, I remained constrained to wisdom. And so contrary to what I've heard my whole life about King Solomon's pursuits, uh, this is not him going out and getting drunk everywhere that he goes and having parties and just drinking to excess and waking up hungover the next morning. Uh, I I think he actually is becoming a connoisseur of wine. He loves the taste and and uh, he's uh, embraced this as a hobby that he gets pleasure from. And and some people read this as Solomon binge drinking. Uh, But he says, I was constrained by wisdom and I remained constrained by wisdom. And, And in Proverbs, the book that he actually wrote, He teaches consistently about the foolishness of drunkenness. And so I think he's taking up wine as a hobby. But whether he's a connoisseur or whether he's a drunk partier, the principle is the same. At at the end of the day, if you try to get happiness from alcohol and being a connoisseur of the finest wines in the world, it's going to be, it's still going to be vanity and madness, he says. Wine and alcohol do have their uses in the Bible. Wine can give us a merry heart, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 says. It also gladdens life situationally uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. He'll say that. In Nehemiah, the people of God are urged to eat the fat and drink sweet wine as a way of celebrating the holiness of the day. Jesus himself drank wine. They called him a drunk. And Jesus turned water into wine. Paul recommends that Timothy have a little bit of wine for his stomach ailment. And so there are uses for alcohol. God created alcohol it's one of his creations, there are uses for it, but it's also dangerous. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 1 says, wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Proverbs 23, 29 says, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has strife, who has complaining, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes, those who tarry long over wine, those who go and try mixed wine. So Solomon looks at this pursuit of making wine and alcohol his hobby. Uh, And like many people do with the good things of life and the things that they enjoy, they make it a hobby and they draw They try to draw some purpose and meaning out of it. And in the end, it too is emptiness, hevel, smoke. It doesn't give us what we're looking for. When wine doesn't work, Solomon tries accomplishments. In verse 4, he says, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. Notice all the personal pronouns here. I, 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 I made, I built, I planted. Now, I would call this verse yard work on steroids. It's myself. I'm building all this for me. The scope of Solomon's accomplishments is underlined by the use of all the plural words. He didn't just build a house. He built houses. He didn't just build a garden, he built gardens, he built vineyards, he built parks. First Kings chapter 7 tells us some of the amazing construction projects of King Solomon. 
Apparently, this king was really good at building things, and he built the house of the Lebanon forest. He built the hall of pillars. He built the hall of judgment out of cedar from floor to ceiling. He built his own house made similarly. He built a house for Pharaoh's daughter, his wife. These were all built with the most exquisite craftsmanship, costly stones, and the most prime of any building material that anyone could find. All of this was meant to wow mainly himself and his guests. This was a wise man who knew how to build things well. And all that is not to mention his crowning achievement, the temple of God in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. You can read of this account in 1 uh, Kings and 2 Chronicles chapter 2. And when you read 1 Kings chapter 6, it describes the dimensions of this temple the, with windows that are high up in the temple walls, side rooms, quarried stones, a stairway to connect three levels, wood panels and flooring, elaborate carvings, gold overlay in the whole interior and the altar in the inner sanctuary. Cherubim made from olive wood and overlaid with gold, olive wood and juniper doors. The temple was constructed in all of its parts according to all its specifications in a span of seven years. Solomon spared no expense. He shipped in the best lumber from, from Lebanon. Um, according to BibleCharts.org, the cost of building the temple today has been estimated to about three to six billion dollars. The cost is so huge that Solomon had to pay off King Hiram by giving him 20 towns in Galilee. Not only did Solomon use the best labor force, he conscripted thousands of slaves from all over Israel. He had 3,300 foremen to manage the construction. Uh, here's what Philip Ryken writes in his book, Everything Matters. The scope of his achievement is indicated by the fact that Kohelet mentions everything in the plural. Houses and vineyards, gardens, parks, trees, and pools. Best of all, it was all for him. These great works, as the Bible called them, were part of man's private residence. The palace of the preacher king was paradise regained, a man-made garden of Eden. I read an article in a scholarly journal this week that said, in which a Dutch theologian was trying to show how all the language in this verse parallels the language shown in Genesis chapter 1, when God created the Garden of Eden. This is Solomon trying to recreate his personal Garden of Eden. And it's clear that a lot of this preacher king's life was devoted to home improvement and yard work. Isn't that crazy to think about? Now, it's easy to get judgmental about King Solomon when he's kind of being criticized here in the Bible, but it's kind of amazing to see all the home improvement projects that we get obsessed with in our culture, especially in Johnson County with COVID. In my neighborhood alone, I've seen about four to five pools, swimming pools installed. I'm not going to judge anyone because, you know, I don't know anybody else's stories, but we have a perfectly nice community pool, and I, I've already seen four and five swimming pools being installed in people's yards, yard projects, backyard patios, new builds, decks, storage sheds. In the affluent Johnson County, we love our home building projects. And to be fair, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you try to pursue those things as if they will give you some sort of purpose in life, and you know if you're doing it or not, if that's where you draw your identity from, listen to the words of King Solomon who tried it 10 times more than you did, and he still wound up calling it emptiness. It's really easy to get caught up in that and to deny that it's really affecting you. Verse 7, he says, I bought male and female slaves. I had slaves who were born in my house. I had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. Here, Solomon tries accumulation, thinking that this will help him find some sort of substance in life. Again, look at all the verbs. I bought, I had, I had. He had economic power. He had a slave force to work for him. He had agricultural power, an agricultural monopoly. He had military power because he took over the treasuries of kings and provinces. The wealth he accumulated was phenomenal. We, in our culture, also suffer from an a limitless capacity to take things that used to be wants 
and to turn them into needs. We live in what social theorist Greg Easterbrook called abundance denial, in which millions of men and women construct elaborate mental rationales for considering themselves materially deprived, and in doing so, only succeed in increasing their unhappiness. So here's some items rated as necessities by America, Americans in 1970 versus 2000. In 1970, 20% of Americans said they needed a second car. In t- the year 2000, 59% said they needed a new car. A second TV, 3% in 1970, 45% in 2000. More than one phone, 2% in 1970, 78% in the year 2000. Car air conditioning. Now, this is one where I'm going to push back on the 11 percenters because, uh, I, you know, I, I remember my air conditioning going out when I lived in Phoenix, and ain't nobody want to drive in a hot car in the middle of the desert. But in 1970, 11% of people thought that car air conditioning was a necessity. And now, in the year 2000, it was 65%. Or what about a dishwasher? 8% in 1970, 44% in 2000. It's interesting that not only have we recently gotten small tastes of, of scarcity in our culture with the toilet paper fiasco of 2020 when there's about a month where you couldn't find any toilet paper. And then this year, uh, in my opinion, there's a much worse scarcity thing going on with the baby formula. It's impossible to find any baby formula right now. If you've never raised a baby, you're not really feeling that. But all the moms of, of uh, infants right now have really struggled to find the baby formula that their babies need. We were getting a little bit of taste of scarcity. And it's kind of crazy to see people just lose their minds over this stuff. It's one thing to say that material things don't satisfy, but it's a whole other thing to actually live it. Solomon poured himself into owning more and more and more and more people, more houses, more power, more taxes, more wealth, thinking that through the hoarding of stuff, he might find meaning and purpose. The next pursuit on this almanac of amusements is art. Verse 8 says, I got singers, both men and women. He must have loved music because he hired professional singers and musicians and dancers to come to his house and perform whenever he wanted to. This is reminiscent of people who make creativity and art the main drive of their life. Some of you are music people, some of you are book people, some of you are art people. Um, I'm a movie person. My modern pursuit of pleasure is constantly looking for that great film experience that sweeps you off your feet. This last week, I went and saw Top Gun Maverick with my wife. And it's ama- it was really amazing to me to walk into a movie theater after, uh, you know, we, people just haven't been back at movie theaters. And we walk in there and there's a big line for the popcorn and it smells like popcorn. And the movie theater was packed and everyone was excited to see the movie. And it transported me back to when I was a kid in 1993 in Jurassic Park, the movie came out in theaters, and there was a line all the way out into the parking lot. They were giving out free pogs. Remember pogs? Seeing a great movie like that, a summer blockbuster, just filled me with nostalgia, this wistful longing that I'm always looking for in great stories, whether it's movies or books. If I'm King Solomon and I'm testing my heart with, with wisdom through the pursuit of pleasure, I'm going to build myself a giant movie theater in my house that has access, immediate access to all the brand new releases. But alas, at the end of the day, this too is meaningless. Without God in the picture, this will not give you what you're looking for. It will just fall just short of satisfaction, no matter how good the things are in life. The next thing on our almanac is this constant arousal that Solomon tries. He says, I acquired concubines. Many concubines, he says, the delight of the sons of man. We know Solomon was famous for his sexual exploits. He loved many foreign women. He clung to these in love. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, which I, it's hard for me even to wrap my, arm, wrap my mind around that. But now that we're, we're not ancient kings, and it's not really possible for us to do what he did in a way that's socially acceptable. But if you're living a life of constant lust 
or if you're constantly letting your imagination entertain sexual thoughts, you're chasing after the same thing that King Solomon chased after, constant arousal. And I think many people are doing this, and many people are in denial about it. You're looking constant. It's like every person you see, the temptation is to imagine sexually every attractive man or woman. The temptation is to gravitate towards lust. And it's like the constant arousals that we chase after in life, not even just sexual. Any dopamine hit, really, that we chase after ultimately is going to leave us wanting more. It doesn't work. Verse 9, he's, here's the last item as he searches for happiness is acclaim. This is a man who wants to be significant. He wants people to celebrate him and see him as significant. He says, I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem, and my wisdom remained with me. He was universally renowned. People invited him to come speak at their thing. He got book deals. He was acclaimed by everyone. Everybody respected his words and what he said. And though this entire explorations throughout this entire exploration of pleasures in his heart, even though everybody respected him, even though everybody acclaimed him, Verses 12 through 17, you, uh, he realized that even the pursuit of wisdom and acclaim itself was only a little bit better than foolishness. He says, the same awaits the fool as the wise man. Verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all of my toil. In all these categories, Solomon allowed himself to do whatever he wanted. Life was a constant yes to whatever was his most present desire. And at the end of his search, we are given King Solomon's appraisal or his final assessment of his pursuit of pleasure. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I expended in doing it. Behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. Verse 20. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. That verb consider, when he says, I considered all that my hands had done, that verb for consider, it literally means to face or to look something in the eye. Solomon is facing up to reality and looking at life the way it really is, and he wants us to know that it isn't pretty. At the end of the day, this king hung over from a life of pursuing pleasure, wakes up and realizes that all of it is empty. Everything he's built, everything he's accumulated, possessed for the sake of his own personal pleasure will be given to someone else who did not work for it after he dies. Or if he's conquered militarily, it'll all be given to somebody else. So if all these good things in life, you know, did you notice that all these things aren't necessarily bad? Laughter, wine, uh, in sexual intimacy, acclaim. All of these desires are very human desires that we have in our hearts. And they're not bad in and of themselves. But how, is, is there any wisdom on, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to read passages like this and just assume that Christianity is this big killjoy and God's a big Debbie Downer and he wants us to just be like monks and lock ourselves into a, a convent and, you know, whip our backs with a, a chain whenever we mess up, you know, but that's not who God is because God created all of these pleasures. And so is there any wisdom on how we are to interact with the pleasures of life? And he gives us a couple things. He sneaks in a couple things at the end of this chapter. First, the greatest of life's pleasures are the simplest. Verse 24, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Even though he experienced everything, life's highest pleasures, and he experienced those in an abundance that you or I will never know in this life. He said the, 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 there's nothing better than, you just, than that you're happy with what you eat today, and you have water to drink, and you have a job that you enjoy. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? 
coming from King Solomon, the way that we learn to rely less on the constant dopamine fix from life's emotional mountaintops is we learn to look around and appreciate the small things because the greatest of life's pleasures are the simplest. I could list about 20 things that I want to buy today. I'd love to have a lake house. I'd love to have a cabin that I escape to, uh, a place where I can study and pray and think and, and get away. I'd love to have a truck. I'd love to have a staircase off the back deck. But when push comes to shove, what I really want is health and a good night's sleep. Isn't that funny? The moment you take health away from a person, None of the material stuff matters anymore. Ask anyone in our church that's gotten a cancer diagnosis or somebody where uh, suddenly their health was taken away. None of the material stuff matters. What matters is time with their family. What matters is, is the simplest pleasures of life. And this is what Solomon is saying. There's nothing better than for a person than she should eat and drink and love his work. Learn to turn every small delight in your life into worship so that you don't rely on the mountaintops that only come from the big pleasures in life. And when you do that, you'll learn how to celebrate the pleasures that God allows you to have in a, with, a, with a sense of gratitude, which leads me to, the, to my second thing here. Number two, the wisdom Solomon gives us for pursuing pleasure. Receive life's pleasures as souvenirs. Verse 24, this also I saw from the hand of God for apart from him who can eat or who can have enjoyment. One thing that Kohelet is sure, is sure of in a world of vanity is that even the small joys we experience, all of it comes from God. They're kind of like souvenirs. I used to not like souvenirs and thought they were a waste of money, but I have a friend who loves souvenirs, and every time he goes on a trip, he'll buy something that reminds him of the place that he once visited, a hat, a poster, a t-shirt, a framed picture. The reason you buy a souvenir is to help you remember the memory or remember the place or remember the people that you went to before, you went with before you leave. And you go to the gift shop and you buy a souvenir. It's a keepsake to remind you of that memory. And I believe God has littered this world with things that cause joy, but they're really just souvenirs. All of us are returning to our true home someday, which will have much greater pleasures than, this, than we have ever known or ever imagined in this world. And the good things that God allows us to enjoy in this life are really just gifts or souvenirs that contain within them a faint longing for something that once was but has never been. And you can never recreate that memory. You can never fully capture what you felt in that moment. You can never recreate Eden, this side of eternity, no matter how hard you try. But life's joys God has given us as momentary and transitory and souvenirs that remind us of where we're headed. And that's the third thing, which is kind of similar, but approach life's pleasures, not just as souvenirs, but also as signposts. If all the world has to offer is gifts from God, then it logically follows that we need to figure out how to find a way to approach every single moment of joy and happiness that we experience to redirect our gaze to the giver of all the good gifts. C.S. Lewis has a good analogy. You're walking on a Sunday afternoon, uh, just a, a nice leisurely stroll on, a, on a, a paved path, sun shining. And then suddenly you enter into the woods and you look around yourself and the forest floor is splattered with patterns of sunlight because of the leaves of the trees and, and uh, the, the sunlight's just kind of bleeding through the canopy of the forest and splashing a pattern of sunlight and shade on the ground and Lewis says that the pleasures in life are like spots on the forest floor where the sunbeam bleeds through. The sunlight illuminates and creates the pattern, but we would be wrong to view the pattern on the, on the ground itself as the object of our worship. Rather, life's pleasures should cause our minds to race up the sunbeam to the sun and that momentary and fleeting pleasures we do get to taste in this life, Lewis says, are patches of God light in the woods of our experience. They're all from the hand of God. Mark Buchanan in his book, 
things unseen, writes, better to figure it out now. This world is booby-trapped. It's rigged for disappointment. On earth, everything falls short of some hoped-for ideal. Every good thing down here has a tragic brevity and funny aftertaste to it. It all falls short and shortly falls apart. None of it possesses any ultimate ultimacy, whether it be sex or possessions or nature or art or accomplishments. All of the good things in life when pursued not as ends, but as gifts become signposts that point us to our Creator. And here's the last thing that I'll close here as we think about the pleasures of life and how we are to interact with them. Savor the Savior. Each week we've been showing how these passages point us to Jesus, the satisfier of our souls. King Solomon pursued a life of hedonism and indulgement, looking for meaning under the sun. And at the end of the day, the only wisdom he could come up with was that it's all empty. It's all smoke. But Jesus Christ, the greater Solomon, resisted everything that Solomon indulged. He was the perfect Savior for unfulfilled sinners because He resisted sin and He was crucified as a perfect and sinless Savior. And the Bible says that it was for the joy set before Him that He endured the cross, having experienced, having indulged none of the pleasures in this world that Solomon indulged. His heart was still filled with joy beyond anything that life could throw at Him. And He, because of that, He is the perfect Savior for unfulfilled sinners like you and I because he resisted sin and he was crucified as a perfect, unblemished Savior. His sacrifice on the cross is eternally su sufficient for you and for I. Jesus has an, Christ has an eternal war, reward awaiting everyone who trusts in him, and he is ready to show you pleasures forevermore. Some of you have been chasing the pleasures of this world in your life only to find only that they are false pleasures. And you need to turn around and get a taste of what Christ has to offer you. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, the psalmist says. Taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalm 34. If we could get a glimpse of the pleasures that await us on the other side of eternity, in an instant we would stop our tireless pursuits of ultimate satisfaction on earth. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Heaven will not just be singing worship songs to God all day, every day, like some, some people have that idea. Heaven will be filled with delights that you and I could never imagine. And God has so much more for you than this world has to offer. Let the good things, let the pleasures that you get to experience in your life let those things cause you to follow the sunbeams back up to the sun. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this almanac of amusements and for the example of King Solomon. This is a hard book to study. It's a hard book to read because it's kind of depressing. Because we know that there's people out there who are living life as if God doesn't exist and they're trying to find meaning and purpose in all these things. Lord, help us to treat life as a gift. Help us to be grateful for the small and simple things and let those pleasures point us to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.